It's become a custom at the end of each year to review the bird species we've seen and recall the wonderful birding moments that we've had. In this episode, I look back at the birds I saw in 2021, tell you a little about the habitats where I found them and share my favourite birding memories. to the Casual Birder podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take pleasure in watching the wild birds around me, wherever I am. In my show, I share the joy of birding. I tell you about the birds I've seen, speak with experts and enthusiasts, go on bird outings, and I share stories from birders around the world. Last episode, I shared a recording of a morning's birding in a beautiful country garden at Pagham Harbour in West Sussex where I heard green woodpecker, kestrel and a lovely robin. I also told about an interaction between a magpie and a squirrel in my garden that kept me entertained one morning. Do take a listen. In episode 106, I look back at the birds I saw in 2021, noting the lifers and the old favourites, and share my best birding moments. But first, I want to say how much I appreciate you for listening to the show. The production of each episode takes quite a bit of time and so I'm thrilled when you tell me that you enjoy what you're hearing. I'm always looking to improve and to provide episodes that are interesting to you. In planning the podcast content for the year ahead, I want to include topics or guests that you would particularly like to hear. So I've created a short survey for you to have your say. You can also leave me feedback on what you like about the show or what you'd like to see done differently. It should only take a few minutes to complete and your answers will have a real impact on the show. You can find the survey at bit.ly forward slash CBP content survey, all one word. CBP is Casual Birder Podcast. And the link is also in the episode notes. It's been really interesting reading the responses that I've received so far, and I'm incorporating those suggestions into my future episode plans. I'd love to hear from as many people as possible, so please do take part. 2021 was a wonderful birding year for me. I ended up seeing 166 species and had the opportunity to observe many of their behaviours and interactions. Although we were on a lockdown in the first part of the year due to the pandemic, afterwards I was able to visit lots of different habitats and regions during our day trips and vacations. I kept lists on eBird for my garden birds and whenever I went out birding. 2021 was my first full year of doing so, and it proved to be a great resource when reviewing my end-of-year totals. Like many birders, I keep several different types of lists. Life list, year list, trip or vacation list, and garden list. My life list has been quite fragmented up until now, spread across many journals and bird guides for the areas visited. So I can't actually say how many species I've identified worldwide. However. I'm now using eBird to create the definitive list. I've been looking through my diaries, bird lists from previous trips and photos to remind myself of what I've seen. In my spare moments, I've been entering them on eBird. It's been lovely to reminisce about the wonderful trips I've been lucky to go on. And I hope this year to get the list up to date. My husband also started using eBird last year and there is a sense of competition between us to find out what our life lists look like, as we've taken a few major international trips independently. Also, I've always been more keen to look at all the species I can, whereas in the past, John has only been interested in key species. That has all changed in the past year, and I'm starting to find that I live with a very enthusiastic birder. I also keep a year list, which starts on January 1st and ends on December 31st. Only birds seen during that year will be included. Of course, many of the birds will be ones that I've seen in previous years, and it's dependent on the habitats and regions I manage to visit. But each year, I hope that I'll see new birds and have the opportunity to observe behaviours that I haven't seen before. And hopefully, over time, these year lists will show me where I'm improving in my knowledge of individual species by showing when in the year I saw the birds and how many new species are added. I'm anticipating that by getting out birding more often, even if only in my neighbourhood, I'll find my regular birds quite quickly in 2022 
encouraging me to search for the lesser seen species. But it doesn't matter if I only end up seeing the same species over and over. I can take the time to really watch them, watch their behaviours, their interactions and learn much more about the individual species. In 2021, I saw 32 lifers or lifebirds, ones that I've never seen before or which I may have seen but couldn't previously identify. I'm pretty strict with myself with the rules I follow and others may have different qualifications for their lists. But to make it on my life bird list, I need to be sure that I've seen a particular bird species. So if someone tells me that I'm seeing a certain bird, unless I can work out for myself the field markings or calls confidently enough to identify the bird on my own in the future, I won't count it. And a note about lifers, I have two levels. If I can identify a bird from sound alone, having never to my knowledge encountered the species before, I'll add it to my lifer list as herd only. This only really applies to birds that have a very distinctive call or song. If in a subsequent year I see the bird, I'll add it again to my lifer list, but that's the final time it would be classed as a lifer. For example, in last year's review show, I listed greater white-fronted goose as a lifer from hearing the call and then having it confirmed on BirdNet. Well, this year I actually saw that species, so I've included it again in my lifer list as an actual sighting. However, it doesn't happen the other way round. A seen life bird for me takes precedence over a heard one. So, for example, in 2021, I was introduced to the call of a water rail for the first time. Thanks, Kieran. As I'd first seen that bird a few years ago, I didn't record that fact on any lists. So I had five herd lifers from 2021, and these were common quail, European turtle dove, great bittern, common grasshopper warbler, and common nightingale. I'll tell you about my 27 seen lifers as I recount my trips for the year. There were five additional species that I'd seen previously in other countries, so they weren't lifers, but I'd never seen them before in the UK. And these were cattle egret, which I'd previously seen in India, great white egret, which I'd seen in California, snow goose, seen at Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia, long-tailed duck, which we saw in Trondheim in Norway, and you might have listened to that episode where we did a bird walk around the town, and crested tit, which I've seen in France. In 2021, I saw 34 species either in or from my garden, and 30 of these were seen by the end of March. So for the rest of the year, I was just seeing the same species again. These included regulars such as European goldfinch, house sparrow, blackbird, European robin, blue tit, wood pigeon and dunnock, birds that it's easy to take for granted because they appear so often. But I was also pleased to welcome black cap, bullfinch, collared dove and a gold crest, which is a rare visitor to my garden. A first for my garden was a herring gull, which stopped by my bird table on three occasions and then was never seen actually in the garden again, although I see them flying over quite often, and that's a big bird to see on my bird table. My first European greenfinch didn't turn up in my garden until the end of April, and swift and cold tit was seen in June, and then in October I heard a tawny owl one night. Who knows what will turn up in 2022? A very big thanks to all who have shared the Casual Birder podcast on social media especially if you've written a review or told others why you enjoy the show. I was thrilled recently to hear a lovely review of the show by Simon London on the Gabby Roslin show on BBC Radio London. Simon heard my last episode, which included a piece about an interaction between a magpie and a grey squirrel in my garden. He said he got really engrossed in the story, wondering what the outcome would be. In fact, I was so intrigued by what he was saying that I wanted to go back and listen to the episode. My thanks to Simon for sharing his review and for letting me know on Twitter that he'd be talking about it. If you share the show on social media, please do tag me. At the beginning of 2021, I started a nature diary inspired by my Twitter friend Mel at Shepherd Wells on Twitter. Unfortunately, I only managed to keep it going until May, but I'm going to try again this year because looking through it helped remind me of particular birding moments I'd enjoyed during the first part of the year. Another resource I had was my top five birds log. Each week on social media, 
I share my top five birds or birding moments from the week and ask you for yours. Some weeks I'm only seeing the same few species, especially if I haven't managed to get out much, which makes picking my top five birds a bit of a challenge. But noticing the behaviours or interactions of even my most commonly seen birds really helps me take joy in the little things. As I review the year, I'll pick the moments that meant the most to me. From January to mid-April, pandemic restrictions meant that I was birding either in my garden or very locally in the neighbourhood. I had the idea to keep a birding audio diary and produced six of them as episodes of this podcast. The links to these are in the episode notes. I saw 37 species within walking distance of my home and, as said previously, 34 of those were either in or from my garden. The additional birds I saw were Eurasian green woodpecker and common pheasant in the farm fields a mile away and Eurasian tree creeper in a small copse that I walked to. Once the lockdown ended, we ventured out to our favourite local heathland and woodland reserves, Haisley Heath, RSPB Farnham Heath, Pamba Forest and Silchester Common. This gave me an additional 16 species, including heathland birds such as linnet, stonechat and Dartford warbler. The moments that I recall from that part of the year were mainly hearing the songs of birds in the mornings as they tried to find mates and define their territories. The morning chorus started to build quite early in the year. One particular memory from March was standing out in the garden at 5.30am listening to all the robins, dunnocks, blackbirds and one lone song thrush in the neighbourhood that was singing. I really hope that song thrush eventually found a mate. I'm always excited when the birds start showing nesting behaviours and in late February and early March I saw blackbirds and magpies gathering nesting material and in early April a blue tit pair started building a nest in our webcam nest box. By the end of April I had 46 species on my year list. Once lockdown was over in May our first vacation in 2021 took us to Suffolk in the east of England. It's an area we'd never really explored before. We stayed near the coastal town of Alderborough and were delighted to find there were lots of nature reserves in the area, including RSPB Minsmere. As we were there at the beginning of May, the dawn chorus was in full swing and I really enjoyed going out into the garden of the house we'd rented each morning to listen to the local birds. I'd be out there before it was fully light, just drinking in the sounds of the birds. There was still frost around on those spring mornings, but the clear skies and wonderful songs more than made up for any discomfort from the cold. 39 species were added to my year list from that week, including eight life birds, bittern, barnacle goose, sedge warbler, common grasshopper warbler, garden warbler, woodlark, European turtle dove and common nightingale. The bittern, grasshopper warbler and turtle dove were identified by sound only. But as they all have really distinctive calls, and as I ran the recordings through BirdNet to be sure, I'm happy with adding them. I also only heard the nightingale, but the pace of song and the time of night made me pretty certain that's what I was hearing. I ended up adding it on eBird as an incidental sighting, as I'd been asleep when I first heard it and not actively birding. I became aware of it as it broke through my dreams, and I got up to stand at an open window recorder and mic in hand, trying to record it. The song came in frequently, but I managed to get a sample which I'll play for you now. I couldn't be sure whether there was just one bird calling or several but far away, so I have edited this sample to cut out the long pauses or the bits where the song was really faint, but I feel this is a good representation of what I heard.
When speaking with past guest Mike Drew about the Nightingale song on episode 101, I was even more convinced. One of the resources that I used during that period was the RSPB Guide to Birdsong, which came with a CD with more than 100 bird sounds included. And so we listened to the species that we thought we might have in the area to help us identify the ones if we only heard them. And I must say, it turned out to be very helpful. Another key memory from Suffolk was hearing my first bittern as I stood in the garden of our accommodation. I was surprised at how much it sounded like a person blowing air over the top of a bottle, but I knew immediately that it was the bittern. Later in the trip, we heard a bittern calling fairly close by in the reed beds at RSPB North Warren. I'm convinced that that was where the bittern had been calling from when I heard it in the garden, which I estimated as being about half a mile away. I know that low notes can travel quite long distances, so it's probably not beyond the realms of possibility for that to have been the case. On the final day of the holiday, it was the global big day. After all the gorgeous weather, this day brought heavy rain and we got thoroughly wet. But it was great fun moving around a variety of sites, ending up at RSPB Minsmere before driving home. I added six birds to my year list just on that day, and two of them were life birds, sedge warbler and barnacle goose. As we left Minsmere to drive home, I was happy that I'd seen 49 species as my contribution to our virtual team results, but I wished I could have made it to 50, a nice round number. Luckily, my husband remembered reading a book by the comedian Bill Bailey that had mentioned always seeing pied wagtails at service stations. As that was a species I hadn't seen that day, we were thrilled when we stopped at South Mims services and there was a pied wagtail. Yay! 50 species to contribute to the Casual Birder podcast team's effort for the global big day. You can hear more about that day and the birds that everyone else saw in episode 99. At the end of May, we went to Haisley Heath again in the hopes of hearing or seeing a Eurasian nightjar. We were successful in that we both heard it and John saw it because I was busy looking down at my recorder when it flew. But you can hear more about that in episode 102. The call went on for a very long time, but here's just a snippet for you. The night jar, plus my trip to Suffolk, took my year list to 86. In June, I mainly did my birding in my garden. And although we visited Haisley Heath a few times, I only added one more species to my year list, a missile thrush. I also had a memorable moment when, on an early morning walk there, we found a really special spot where we were surrounded by birdsong from greater whitethroat, blackcap, linnet and garden warbler. As we'd made such an early start, we'd brought breakfast with us and we sat and listened to the birds while eating. It was glorious. The Swifts arrived in our neighbourhood in June. I'd seen a few in Suffolk in May, so they were already on my year list. But I was able to add them to my garden list as species seen from my garden. They didn't use our nest boxes this year, but I still enjoyed seeing and hearing the screaming parties high over my garden. Around this time, the blue tit chicks were close to fledging, and the male blue tit became very bold as he recognised that I was providing live mealworms to my garden birds. A robin also became tame for a couple of days before disappearing, even coming to take some mealworms from a handheld dish. That was a really special time for me. In July, we spent a week in a cottage in Gloucestershire. I met up with Annika, a listener and active member of our Facebook group. She took me to a great nature reserve managed by the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, Coombe Hill Canal and Meadows. It was a really hot day, but we had a lovely chat as we strolled along the canal, stopping to see birds along the way. 
What a great way to go birding. I was thrilled with the lovely views of sedge warblers singing in the low scrub. I saw five new species for the year, black-tailed godwit, yellow-legged gull, common raven and two life birds, green sandpiper and western yellow wagtail. A very fleeting glimpse which Annika saw first and identified, but which was unmistakable. Another birder there told us that the common quail had been heard in the fields nearby, and later that week I went back with my husband, having made ourselves familiar with the call beforehand from various websites and from the CD in the RSPB Guide to Birdsong. On that evening walk, we heard it. So, another life bird. We stood around for ages trying to pinpoint its movements in the field in the hopes of seeing it. But they're small birds and easily hidden by the crops and grasses. We had to make do with identification by call only. I was sorry to leave that cottage. It was really comfortable, beautifully decorated in a very simple style. And it was just a few minutes walk away from a scrubland filled with grasses and shrubs. It was so pleasant to walk there in the morning or evening of the very hot days, listening to various birds singing, and with the possibility of seeing buzzards and green woodpeckers, and hearing white throats and linnets. The additional species seen in Gloucestershire took my year list to 93. During August and September, I mainly watched birds in my garden and neighbourhood, although we did manage some trips out to Farnham Heath. Seeing a spotted flycatcher there brought my year list to 94. In my top five birds weekly posts, the moments I recall are mainly about watching birds chilling out in my garden or watching different species at the water baths. I especially liked seeing the small group of house sparrows that regularly took over one of my water baths and treated it like a private spa. I'll post some videos of that on my YouTube channel. During these days, I practised photographing the birds in an attempt to improve my skills. I'm still a work in progress. October brought three trips away for me and an additional 22 species for my year list. As I spoke about in the last episode, I made two trips to West Sussex and one to the Isle of Wight. I gained four lifers from these trips, grey plover, sandwich tern, common green shank and common snipe. Quite possibly I had seen these last two birds before, but not enough of a view for me to be sure that is what I was seeing. Along with the lucky nighttime call of a tawny owl in my neighbourhood, My year list was at 116 as we headed off in November for a wildlife holiday in Scotland. Visiting Speyside in the east and Isla in the Western Isles, and with the help of Mike Dilger, our guide during the first week, I saw 16 lifers in Scotland. These were snow goose, greater white-fronted goose, pink-footed goose, hooper swan, greater scorp, velvet scoter, common scoter, common golden eye, red grouse, black grouse, bar-tailed godwit, Red Knot, Red Throated Diver, Black Throated Diver, Merlin and Twite. I also added another 25 species to my year list, taking it to 157. There were so many wonderful moments from our vacation in Scotland, but my favourites were hand-feeding cold tits at RSPB Loch Garton, seeing a close flyby of a white-tailed eagle at the ferry terminal as we were leaving Isla to return home, a wonderful send-off and our group being taken by our tour leader, Mike Dilger, to stand on the seabed at the Moray Firth, once the tide had gone out, to see hundreds of water birds and waders. I asked Mike to tell me what birds we could see. So we're standing in the middle of Fintorn Bay. Mud. Mud. <laughs> Glorious mud, Susie. <laughs> we're right in the middle of the estuary. It's um, the, the River Fintorn um, runs right in front of us, out to the Moray coast. Um, where the River Fintorn goes right the way back into the mountains, the Cangorn Mountains, and we're in the middle of an enormous estuary, and there are so many birds around us. It's frankly astonishing, and it's really noisy as well. It's loads of birds to see, but also using your ears, plenty to hear. Yeah, and it's an absolutely beautiful morning. There's very little wind. It's kind of a blue sky with a little bit of grey cloud, but it's really, really calm. So when we do see birds close up, we're seeing beautiful reflections in the water. Mm-hmm. Um, but just looking out, it's not too far away. I mean, we're, we're, we're not disturbing the birds by being out here. Um, but we can see big banks of birds. You can hear a curlew in the background there. But there's an amazing number of species. Do you want to tell us some of the species we're seeing here? Ah, well, where do we start? Uh, wildfowl and waders with a few geese thrown in. First and foremost, it's a brilliant place in early winter for pink-footed geese. 
They'll spend the night here where they feel safe and then early in the morning they'll go into the barley fields to feed. So we're seeing skeins of them above us. They're going inland. You can hear that wink, 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 wink. And it's a rubbish name, pink-footed geese. I think it's chocolate-headed goose. Because half the time when they're standing in mud, they've got brown feet, not pink feet. <laughs> so we've had lots of pink feet flying over. And wildfire and waders, I mean, brilliant place for pintail. That beautiful, elegant bird with that long, stately neck, chocolate head again, and that white line up the side. And it's got a bit of a yellow, yellow bum, like vanilla ice cream colour, with a black, a black tail and that lovely long tail streamers. So we've got a lot of pintail out there. Waders, bartail godwit, blacktail godwit, Curlew, red shank, golden plover. These are pink feet flying overhead. Here. Just one on its own. Look Just at that. one on its own. Apparently, there were 19,000 <laughs> here last night. But the waders are wonderful. There's Bartel Godwit and Blacktail Godwit, which are two of my favourite ones. Bartel Godwit is a high Arctic breeder coming down here, much more common in North Scotland and North Britain in the winter. And the Blacktail Godwit's icy down in the Somerset levels close to where I live. Uh, the bartail's a bit scaly, likes to hang out on its own. The blacktail's a bit more elegant, longer-legged, needle, long bill, like a sewing machine feeding, looking for all the um, lugworms and ragworms and little tiny shrimps in the mud. And then in between those is the dunlin, the little tiny dunlin running around, the archetypal small bird, and a lovely flock of golden plover. Oh, weren't they? Absolutely wonderful. They took off briefly and flew around and what a fantastic sight with the light on them really looking golden that's the first time I've really seen them looking so golden and then flashing white as they turn in the air just absolutely beautiful there's also been uh, we've got red shank a small number of red shank and some oyster catchers ones that I'm quite familiar with and the curlew plenty and the curlew, curlew bubbling yeah, away so three three species there that I confidently can identify on my own the godwit have been a little bit more difficult, but you gave us some tips just now about the difference between the bar-tailed and the black-tailed godwits in terms of the shape of the bill. Yeah, the black tail tends to be a bit longer and slightly upturned, whereas the bar tail got a bit straighter. The key thing as well is the black tail godwit is more sociable, likes to hang out with itself. With the bar tail, a bit more antisocial, um, feeding away, nice sewing machine action. And because the bar tail godwit has got shorter legs, so between the knee and it, it's, its rump or its vent, that femur is much shorter. You can often pick them out from a distance, even if you're unsure. Obviously, when they fly, they're easy because the bar tail's got a barred tail and barred wings, whereas the black tail goblet looks amazing. It's got a massive big white wing stripe, a huge big white band across its tail. So when they fly, they're incredibly easy, but they can be quite tricky when they're on the ground. So sociable black tail goblets, antisocial bar tails, a bit shorter, a bit stocky. And the thing I always look for with bar tail goblets is they look really scaly across the back, whereas the black tail is much more kind of plainer, smoother grey. So they can be quite confusing to people who don't see them very often. Now, we're, we are out here in the middle of the estuary and, it, and we're, we're relatively close to the birds. I mean, they're still by sight, they're little dots. Mm. And um, you can sort of see some of them that you recognise by the shape or the colour. But the vast majority of them, to my eyesight at the moment, small dots. So majority of us here are using binoculars, but you've also got a scope. And that makes a massive difference, doesn't it, for the waders? I think particularly for, for birds on the sea, on the coast on estuaries a scope is pretty essential i have to say um, when you're in woodland it's about as much use as a chocolate teapot half the time because the birds are moving so quickly you can't get on them unless they perch but the great thing is we're taking a group of guests out today and the lovely thing about a scope is you can set it up you can lock it off and you can point out one individual bird and my scope's got 30 to 60 times my binoculars only 10 times right so the birds that are right on the edge of binoculars you can definitively identify with the scope so they are incredibly useful and usually susie when you're watching on estuaries on the coast the birds can be really really long way away so it just helps you clinch that id plus helps less experienced bird watchers get on it or if you can't find the bird we're looking for in amongst that flock you can hone in on it and but, tee it up yeah that is really key because um even now i still find it quite overwhelming when there's a large number of birds all seeming to look the same trying to find those individuals like you, you spotted some shovelers out there mm. and um i think i could have quite easily have lost those in amongst all of the the brown bodies out there even with the very distinctive bill because 
it's the pure numbers of, of birds. But the lovely thing is we're out here, we're at low tide, we won't be here in high tide, otherwise me and you no, will be up water. to our nether regions in water. <laughs> We've got all the time in the world. Just to sit there, take your time, just slowly work through the flock. We're not in any rush to find the birds. So it's just it's just beautiful. It's a, As you say, it's a glorious day. The light's quite low. So actually for the photographers in our group, they're having a fab time as well because they've got that almost that like golden hour was being extended so the light's nice uh, lovely weather uh, there's no wind and so we're actually enjoying the sounds we can hear the, the curlews the red shank there's the brr, brr of the of, of the dunlin as well that are calling away uh, it's a sight and sound magnificence yes no that's it's quite a few... slight, slight strange choice of words though, <laughs> you know what i mean no, it's an absolutely beautiful day and uh, I look forward to doing some more identifying of new species uh, for today as well. Um, so thanks very much, Mike. Thanks for your time and uh, looking forward to the rest of the day. During our long journey back from Scotland, John and I reminisced about the fabulous birds we saw and the experiences we'd had. I'll be saving that recording for a future episode. At the end of December, we spent a couple of weeks in Norfolk. I was able to add the final nine species to my year list taking it to 166. They were Egyptian goose, common potchard, common crane, Iceland gull, great white egret, cattle egret, hen harrier, barn owl and field fare. As I mentioned earlier, I had seen cattle egrets before in India, but I was thrilled to see them in a field just behind where we were staying. And a couple of times I saw them actually standing on the cattle that they were associating with. I took a video of one standing on top of a cow and it pooped on the cow's back. I'm not quite sure how the cow felt about that. I finished the year with a twitch for an Iceland gull. I got chatting with another birder, Dennis, at RSPB Titchwell Marsh, and he mentioned an Iceland gull was being seen regularly, just half an hour down the coast at Cly Marshes. I'm not usually a twitcher, that is, someone who travels to see a rare bird, so that they can add it to their life list. However, with this bird being so close and sounding like it was in reasonable health, it gave us a good excuse to visit Cly Marshes, the oldest nature reserve in Norfolk. And let's be honest, being so close to the end of the year, it was a chance to boost my year list. We saw the gull almost as soon as we left the beach car park and we were able to watch it for a few minutes before it flew off. I think that we were really lucky because later we met some birders who said that they'd walked up and down that beach for quite some time and hadn't seen the gull at all. So thanks very much to Dennis for giving me that great information. Later on that day, in one of the reserve's hides, I met two YouTubers, Liam from A Shot of Wildlife and Fred from Watcher Wildlife. Links to their channels are in the episode notes. We had a great chat about equipment and filming wildlife. I was secretly pleased to see that we were all using similar cameras and mics. They had just seen snow buntings on the beach, so John and I rushed down there in the hopes of adding another species to my list. Despite waiting around for over an hour until sunset, we were unlucky. Speaking to other birders there, it seemed we'd missed them by about 10 minutes. I have seen snow buntings before in Nova Scotia, so they wouldn't have been a lifer, but they would have been a first for me in the UK. The next day was New Year's Eve and we were due to travel home. It was a glorious day with beautiful blue skies and as we'd been beset by rainy weather during the week, we postponed leaving Norfolk and had another day at RSPB Titchwell. And it was the last day of the year, so a good chance to see possibly another species. We had some lovely sightings of avocet, teal, western marsh harriers, common snipe and common redshank. And I did get my final new bird of the year, just as the sun was setting on this perfect day, a great white egret. Not a lifer, because I'd seen them in California before, but still a lovely bird to see in the UK. And that's how I ended my year with seeing 166 species. If you would like to help support the podcast production, you can add to the show's tip jar by buying me a virtual coffee at ko-fi.com. Tips will help pay for transcription costs. Episode transcriptions are an important aid to accessibility and also help people to find the show from web searches. I use an automated system to produce the first draft transcripts, but they require further refinement by a human to get an accurate transcript, including the proper formatting. Three virtual coffees would pay for one month's automated transcription. Five virtual coffees are required for each finalised transcription by a human. My current goal is £200, which will buy six months of automated transcription and ten completed episodes. 
If you're able to help, you'll find the link to Kofi.com in the episode notes. But all of your support, financial or otherwise, is very much appreciated. Thanks so much to Mo for buying me a coffee since the last episode. I asked you to tell me about your best birding moments from 2021. Mike Drew, past guest from the Nightingale episode, said, Over this year, I've recorded 125 species of bird, and my highlights are seeing a white-tailed eagle in March, taking part in the two global birdwatch events, seeing puffins with my daughter, as it's a bird she's always wanted to see, and a visit to Lapland, and spotting Siberian tit and Siberian jay. How lovely that you took your daughter to see puffins, Mike. I bet she was enthralled. I love seeing them, and I hope they'll be on my list for 2022. Karin sent this update. Hi there, Susie, and all casual birders out there. It's Karin here from Olo in Finland. Trying not to think too hard about my best birding moments of last year, because it's just so difficult. Uh, I've kind of narrowed it down a little bit. Both uh, two moments, both are lifers. The first was just the crazy experience of going out at minus 25 degrees Celsius, walking on the frozen sea and spotting bearded reedlings in a very, very cold coastal area. Um, But actually, that has kind of been topped by being on a birdwatching tower in summer hearing a cuckoo, um, a bird I've heard all my life in England and in Finland, and taking a lot of time watching the trees, trying to be patient, and finally, finally seeing it. And it's such a distinctive bird. So that was a life tick by sighting, and it was absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, that's what I've distilled it down to. Here's to many more great moments for everybody in 2022. Congratulations on your life as Karin, especially for walking out on that frozen sea. Bearded reedlings must be really tough little birds to survive those temperatures. I bet they looked like little puffballs. And being in an observation tower seems like the perfect way to see cuckoos. Sean from the Isle of Rum sent this. Hi Susie, it's Sean here. Um, One of the uh, best birding moments I had in 2021 was... uh, going to visit the Manx Shearwater Colony uh, on the island that I live on. Um, the Shearwater's nest are on the top of uh, the mountains here on the Isle of Rum um, and we went up Halival back in July. Um, the Shearwater's come into the colony at night time um, so we had to leave um, late in the evening and We spent most of the night up in the Shearwater Colony, a beautiful, calm, quiet evening, which was great for recording the Shearwaters as they came in uh, to their burrows. Um, uh, Here is a recording that I took that evening. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. What a truly fabulous experience, Sean. Thank you so much for sharing it. It feels a bit disrespectful to say it, but they sound like little gremlins at a party. Angel said, I had a fairly birdie year, thanks in part to moving to a new state. I saw 353 species, picking up 20 lifers. My favourite memories include spending quality time photographing a blue-winged warbler, as well as seeing a trifecta of new hummingbirds in southeast Arizona, white-eared, lucifer and beryline. My personal birding goal for 2022 is to make my new urban backyard more bird-friendly. I'm hoping to install native plants and set up watering stations once the danger of freeze is over. 
That's a really laudable goal for 2022. If we're lucky enough to have some outside space ourselves, now is a great time to look at it and think about how we can improve it for wildlife. Andrew Kelly said, 153 species represents a pretty typical year for me over the past five or six years, and in fact, exactly the same as last year for all of UK. I tried twitching a few years ago when I reached my target of 200, but I didn't enjoy it half as much as concentrating on exploring wherever I am, at home or on holiday. To that end, the 79 birds seen in my local village patch was fairly typical, whilst the year garden and wharfdale totals of 42 and 100 respectively were both slightly down on previous years. I may not twitch much, but I do enjoy a good list. Just one full lifer, a ring-tailed duck seen in March, and one that would be dodgy for any legal list, a ringed teal seen at Welney in November, almost certainly an escapee. The first duck, and the recent Great Northern Diver took my all-time Yorkshire total through the 200 mark. Other highlights? 1. The Global Bird Race we did in May. My first ever. Other highlights? 1. The Global Bird Race we did in May. My first ever. I suppose that was almost one mega twitch. Hope to do one in good weather next time. 2. A Week on Isla. Bird watching extraordinary especially the wildlife seen immediately from and around the cottage we were staying in. Chuff on the roof waking me up on the first morning, hares on the track to the house, buzzards mewing overhead every day, myriad of small birds at almost all times, all showing what this world could and should be like closer to home. 3. Scoping out a hunting barn owl for a good half hour from our back door early one morning in March plus the other two new garden ticks, Nuthatch and Lesser Redpole, taking the all-time list to 63. 4. Actually watching our blue tits fledge from the bird box on the kitchen wall whilst eating breakfast outside back in June. First time I've ever seen that live. I could go on, but that'll more than do. There have been lots and lots of brilliant small moments this year. Looking forward now to 2022. No targets other than to get out and about a bit even more and explore in greater depth. Wow, Andrew, you had such an amazing year. 79 species seen on your local patch and 42 in your garden is wonderful. Congratulations on taking your all-time Yorkshire species through the 200 mark. That is so awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed visiting Isla as well. We were there in November and I'd love to see what it's like earlier in the year, especially when the birds are breeding. I hope I'll be able to go back sometime. I'd love you to tell me about your bird experiences or special birding trips or even your favourite birds found while casually birding from your armchair. You can send me a voice clip or a message. Go to the contact page on my website, casualbirder.com. I look forward to hearing from you. In the next episode, I'll be looking forward to 2022 and the birding challenges I'm taking part in. We'll also hear what birding plans you have, like Alfie. Hi Susie, it's Alfie again. On the 1st of January, I went to Attenborough Nature Reserve to take a few photographs and begin my 200 bird year challenge. Last time I did this, I saw 119 species throughout the year, but this time I am aiming to see all 200. During my visit to Attenborough, I recorded a Chetty's warbler, a life for me, and saw the rare Siberian chiffchaff alongside a few other birders. Overall, it was an amazing day because we saw 41 species to start off the 200 bird year challenge. I've recently uploaded my sightings on eBird, which I'll continue to do throughout the whole year. Thank you so much for putting my trip report on the last podcast episode. I really enjoyed it. I was amazed that you stayed at Keldy Castle because it was a place I wanted to go and explore on the holiday, even though we didn't have time. Thanks for listening from Alfie. Congratulations on your life for Alfie. And good luck with your 200 species challenge. What a wonderful aim for your birding year. Do let me know how your list is progressing. There are quite a few birding events coming up that you can take part in, no matter what level of experience you have. And if you live in the UK, I hope you'll be taking part in the Big Garden Bird Watch this coming weekend, the 28th to the 30th of January. It's just about still time to sign up online and take part, and the link is in the episode notes. Take a listen to episode 85 with Jamie Wyver, who tells us all about the Big Garden Bird Watch and why it's so important for people to take part. He also gives tips on the best type of food to give birds and shares ideas for making your garden wildlife friendly. I'll be watching my garden birds and sharing my checklist with the RSPB. Do tell me about your best moments of taking part. There was dismay last year when Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust 
announced that they were no longer running the bird fair that had been a mainstay of birders' calendars for so many years. But big news just released is that the new Global Bird Fair has been created by past guest Tim Appleton, MBE, and his team. It'll be taking place on the 15th, 16th and 17th of July at the Oakham Showground in Rutland, which is still near enough to Rutland Water Nature Reserve if you want to see ospreys. This will be a great opportunity for birders to come together and use the energy of attendance to boost our personal pledges and actions for supporting bird life around the world. Tickets go on sale for the new venture on February the 14th. I plan to be there for all three days. If you're going, do let me know and perhaps we can meet up. Find out more at globalbirdfair.org. If you enjoy the show, please do tell a friend or give the show a shout out on social media. Personal recommendation is such a powerful way to help others find the show. And don't forget, tag me in your posts. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by following or subscribing to the show wherever you listen. And don't forget to take part in the survey. All links mentioned in this episode can be found in the episode notes or on the show's webpage at casualbirder.com. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. Podcast.